Good morning for everyone that's joining us so far. Today we've got pigs and feral animals. Um, we'll wait a little bit longer for people to start logging in and joining in and then we'll get kicked off. Uh, today's topic's a bit of an important one and a, a, a favourite of mine for sure. For um, so we'll so see far. how that Today goes. We are picking up my phone there playing in the background. There we go, all fixed. All right, sweet, sweet, sweet. Here we go. Good morning, folks. Uh, Rossi here from Cockatoos. Make sure you send through who you're with today. If you're with your kids, send through their names and their ages so I can give them a shout out, give them a g'day. And uh, if you're by yourself or your mate or your mum or your dad or whoever you are, just um, in the comments there, send through um, who you are who and your kids and what ages and all sorts and we'll, um, we'll say g'day. And that way I can uh, answer their questions well later on as well. Um, so if you do have questions as we go today, make sure you type them in the comments. I'll see them. I'll see them a few seconds uh, after you send them through. Um, but I'll get to them as we go anyway. So yeah, pretty cool topic today. We're looking at feral pigs. It's going to be a cracker. Uh, I've been studying these animals for quite a few years now. I'd say if I really wanted to look at the word study, I'd say I'd been studying them for about 20 years. Um, as an ecologist, probably only for the last 10. Um, but they're an incredibly amazing, very, very intelligent animal. Um, and a lot of us in Australia have interactions with them one way or another. And a lot of us also hunt them. So um, brilliant topic today. Hey, morning, Sari and Billy. Morning, Shirley. How are you, mate? Hey, good to hear from you. Yeah, so we're going to get into today to a bit of the biology behavior uh, of feral pigs and what they're like and what they're doing to Australia, um, how they impact our ecosystems. Um, but a few nitty gritty things too will include some cool tips for hunters. Um, but we're gonna go through quite a lot of old research that we've done over the years in Cape York, uh, Lakeville National Park and Central and Western Cape York as well. So some beautiful info in there today and we'll get kicked off uh, in a few more minutes once we get a few more people uh, logging in. So give us, a, give us a wave down the bottom. If you have any troubles hearing us, uh, make sure you just send us a, a comment or, a, or an emoji or something. Let us know you're having trouble. Morning, Jessica, how are you, mate? Um, but yeah, let us let us know who you're with today, who you got, um, so I can give them a shout out and give them a g'day. As we go through this morning, we will be uh, talking about a few, few of our other feral animals very briefly, uh, more as an introduction, just to see what else we have out there. Um, as opposed to going in depth, but today he's definitely focusing on feral pigs. So yeah, hey morning, Braden. Morning, Sarah. Hey morning, Laura. How are you? Good to see you. Happy ISO. Hope it's all going well. Fingers crossed. We'll be out of this pretty soon. So uh, I'll probably end up continuing these talks anyway because they've been pretty fun for me, and um, it looks like there's been a good good bit of information getting out there. Now, when you talk flat chat for an hour, you end up needing a bit of. Uh, the old nectar of the gods. So I'm gonna have a couple of sits as we go today. So excuse me when I do that. Otherwise, I'll be pasty and sounding like bloody uh, Jonathan Verson or Darren Lockyer by the end of it. Hello, Sarah, Tilly, Sally, Leo, and Molly. Welcome, welcome to the chat. Hey, morning, Diane, Isaac, Olivia, Anthea, and Luke. Hope everyone's doing well today. All right, we're gonna get kicked off in a couple of seconds here. I'll start, excuse me, I'll start probably by going through a few of our other feral animals first before we really dig into pigs. Um, that way we can provide a bit of a context on what else is going on in Australia in the, in the feral animal scene. Um, and then we'll really start to nail down specifically on feral pigs. Hey, good morning, Bill. Morning, Dion. How you going? Bill all the way from Seattle in the States. Dion up in Cape York at the moment and Cohen. So yeah, good to, good to have you on today. Um, Dion's probably going to see quite a few of the pictures or maybe even individual pigs that he's seen on some of the research projects he's been a part of as well. So I used to work with Dion up in Cape York, um, an amazing leader up in the Cape, um, a great voice for the people up there. But yeah, Dion was one of the managers of one of the, the ranger groups that I worked with up there in the past. So um, we'll probably see some of the pictures that we took together on this project later today. All right, so let's start. Let's have a look at some of our other invasive animals that we have today. Um, so let's kick it off right now. So Australia, uh, natively before European colonization, there were no ungulates. Uh, so ungulates are any hooved animals. Now, if we have a look down here, we can't really see this guy's feet. 
I should have a look. But ungulates are hooved animals, so there were no horses, no cows, no buffalo, no pigs, no goats, no deer. All of those animals have hard hooves. Now, what that does is it changes the soil dynamics. Now, if you imagine all of our native animals, we've got a lot of marsupials, a lot of mammals, kangaroos, um, those sorts of things, and they all have soft paws. Now, when soft paws walk on soil, walk on grass, there's not a lot of damage. Um, so in Australia, we all uh, originally had just soft pawed animals, no hard hoofed animals. Um, what is Neil? Um, so what the introduction of all these invasive animals with hooves or ungulates has done is it's changed our soil dynamics. It's increased erosion, erosion leads to increased turbidity, more runoff, the runoff goes into the reef, into catchments. Um, there's so many flow on effects. It even affects the bacteria in the soil um, and, and those dynamics. So hooved animals in Australia have a massive, massive impact on uh, on our on our um, on our organisms in the soil and everything else. And there's flow ons everywhere we go. So we'll go through a few of these today. Yeah, respect to you, good man. Um, all right, so we're going to start. We'll have a look at one of our essentially what we still call it as, as a native slash feral. There's a lot of controversy about it but it is the poor dingo and there are introduced feral or wild dogs, which are a big problem. Um, but essentially we think the dingo has been here for up to as long as 12 to 10,000 years. Um, there's various thoughts on how it got, got here. Um, one of the common thoughts, uh, which I think is a little bit debatable is that it was brought over on seafaring canoes, um, about 4,000 years ago, but there's actually land bridges from Australia to Papua New Guinea. Um, back in the day, that that land bridge to the Torres Strait uh, has only disappeared not not so long ago. Um, we're talking maybe ten thousand years ago. So um, in that time before that, uh, quite often the I, I like the theory that um, dingoes or the dogs at the time were pursuing prey down through the Torres Strait when there was a land bridge, and about ten twelve thousand years ago they came through um, in that time and they've evolved in Australia for that time. So. I, I kind of I, I love dingoes. I think they're an amazing animal. They're incredibly intelligent. We have uh, purebred dingoes in Australia. Still, quite a lot of those are on Fraser Island, and that's why you can't take your own dogs over there because um, wild dogs would dilute the the native stock, the native genetic stock of purebred dingoes. There's purebred dingo breeding programs in Australia. Um, there's a couple up at a place called Linkhaven in the Daintree, the guy up there runs an amazing program. He's got a couple of dingoes, gives an amazing talk if you stay there or you pop in for a coffee. Um, but those animals are incredibly beautiful. Now, unfortunately, this one here, he's actually digging up a turtle nest. We watched him over a few nights. Um, I might actually play the video now because it's uh, it's relevant. Um, but this this dingo here, they do need protein and so they, they exploit different sources of protein. Um, wild dogs entirely different as well, but these these are essentially native dingoes we think. But here we go. This is um, the first night he's coming in. So this is the twenty sixth at the twenty sixth of July, twenty fourteen, at about eight o'clock at night, and he's just started to dig the nest. He actually disappears for a while, and then he comes back at midnight. Here he is again, and then two days later he comes back again and digs up the rest of that nest. So. Over a few nights, he digs up and eats the nest, the, the eggs from that turtle nest. So, um, poor Dingo, he gets a bad rap for a lot of reasons, but um, he's essentially just surviving. He's exploiting a resource that's been here for thousands of years, and he's doing what he needs to do to survive, get protein. If it's a female, females obviously have a higher, higher protein requirement because A, they have to breed and hold uh, a litter within them, and then uh, they have to lactate. Um, so, their protein requirements are higher. Morning Katrina, morning Amanda, morning Joey. Uh, so we're talking about dingoes at the moment and other feral animals we have in Australia and then we're going to go into feral pigs uh, in a few minutes. Alright, so there's one of our kind of debated uh, feral animals slash native animals. Feral being the, the wild dog or domestic dog, um, native being the dingo. Alrighty, let's have a look. What do we got next? We got deer, so these are some rusa deer. Um, deer are a big problem in Australia. I think we've got uh, six species from memory. There's rooster, chittle, fallow, hog, um, reds. Must be missing one or two there. Um, but yeah, lots, uh, lots of different species of deer in Australia and also destructive. They're starting to bring in uh, systems of tags and shooting down south in Victoria, but up this way 
Uh, it's pretty much a free for all. Um, like I was saying earlier, no ungulates native to Australia. So no animals with hooves ever used to live in Australia. So that's one of the biggest problems with a lot of these invasive animals is they uh, don't belong here and they change our soil dynamics. So deer have hooves, goats have hooves. Let's see who's next. Oh, foxes, mate. Crikey, mate. Foxes are an absolute disaster for our native animals. Um, between foxes and cats, they are responsible already for 22 animal extinctions, native animal extinctions. So foxes and cats directly uh, responsible for the extinction of 22 native animal Australian species, which is absolutely bizarre. So this guy, while he might look cute and pretty, he does not belong in Australia whatsoever. Um, he's a predator. Um, I think he was originally brought in for sport. Um, can't remember exactly. It could have also been for rabbit control. Bit of a flawed logic there because when you, when you bring in a predator for the control of a prey species, instead of controlling that species, the prey species actually supplements their feed and boosts the predator species. And then there's more predator species that just end up adapting to hunt the native animals. So bit of flawed logic there, but the fox is a cheeky fellow and he's not welcome here either. So lots of people in Australia hunt these guys and it's good, it's great that they do. Um, these are a huge, huge problem. All right, now goats. Again, goats are a big problem. They are highly reproductive, highly successful, highly adaptive. Um, they have been put on islands around Australia, especially along the East Coast. So back in the day, let's look back at in the 1770s, people brought um, feral animals to Australia as food sources. Up the East Coast, pigs and goats are actually used to stock some of the islands. So any of the old seafarers that were traveling through would have a food resource if they happen to get uh, shipwrecked somewhere. They'll be able to go to an island and get pigs or goats. So back in the day, they actually stocked some of the East Coast islands with pigs or goats. And to this day, um, these islands have them. So Hinchinbrook Island, one of the biggest islands in Australia, still has feral pigs on it. Um, islands down around Palm Island, Orpheus along there, um, still have goats on them. They tried to use different methods. Um, one, one highly contested one a little while ago was they put dingoes with tracking collars on them with 1080 injectors in there to reduce the populations of goats on the island. Now these goats, they eat so many plant species, it's ridiculous. So plant species really struggle with goats around. Um, what they do is they end up, uh, they eat all the low foliage on the trees. Um, that allows more wind in, the wind kills other plants. Uh, their hard hooves trample, cause erosion and there's a bit of a cascade of effects there. So these guys are really, really devastating. Um, they also compete with other animals, especially grazing animals for food and natives. So in an area where you see goats, um, the vegetation is often really, really bare. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's, they, they, they have huge impacts on our native species as well. Good morning, holy, Nic Nicola, Richie, Briley, Anna, Jesse. Is it beer time yet, mate? It's beer time somewhere, right? Hey, Paul Lardy, how are you? And kids, good to see you all. All right, we've just been talking about the various uh, feral animal species we have in Australia. So far, we've gone through uh, wild dogs, uh, deer, foxes, goats. Now, let's... Jesus, this guy. I reckon if there's one animal in Australia that's invasive, that impacts our native animals more than anything else, it is this guy here. Now, I'm not a cat specialist, um, I understand how, how much they impact our native animals, um, but I've got some figures here. I'm not particularly good. I don't have them in my head, so I'm going to read them out to you. Here are some scary figures on feral cats. Feral cats kill more than 1.5 billion native animals per year. 1.5 billion per year. Um, I've shot a few cats over my time with a rifle when I've been doing field work. Every time I've cut them open, I used to do diet studies on feral pigs, so I'm cutting open stomachs isn't anything surprising to me. I'd cut open their stomachs, and you would quite often find four or five animals, skinks or mammals, in their stomachs, undigested. So they've just eaten those in the last few hours. If you looked at their whole tract, I guarantee you'd probably find 20, 30, 40 different animals in their digestive tract at one time. So feral cats kill 1.5 billion native animals per year. They are incredibly destructive. Um, now, they've been tame, tamed for about 4,000 years, cats have. Um, they've been tamed or they've tamed us, who knows? One way or another, we love cats as, as a whole. There's 2.8 million feral cats in Australia. 
have a think about this. There are 4 million pet cats in Australia. There's only about 25 million people. But there are 4 million pet cats in Australia. Now, on average, every cat in the bush, so every feral cat, kills... Uh, each cat in the bush kills 740 animals a year. So each one of those 2.8 million feral cats kills about 740 animals per year. So that's about two or three animals a day at least. Now, that's an average. So that means some are lower and some are higher. So I wouldn't be surprised if some animals are getting up to 10 native species per day, which is just ridiculous. Um, when I was bow hunting once, I went out to a, a, a dam on a cattle station in the afternoon. I knew there was pigs coming in the water. I walked up to this dam. Here's a cat sleeping on the corner of this dam down the bottom of the water, just right next to the water line. It wakes up because a flock of pigeons fly to the top of the dam. It wakes up as they as they um, as they fly and land. This cat goes from being asleep to being awake to hunting mode, stalks up the, the wall of the dam, and sprints at one of these pigeons and gets a pigeon, and I reckon within about 15 seconds of it waking up. That's how long it took. They are incredibly, incredibly successful, and they're just a-holes. They're pretty much just big a-holes in, in the bush, so. Now, the scary thing is, while our feral cats kill about 740 animals a year, on average, each pet cat of ours kills about 75 native animals per year. And a lot of these go unseen by the owners. Now, even though uh, feral cats, um, urban, sorry, urban cats or pet cats kill fewer animals, because of their density in cities, they are actually killing more per square kilometre than feral cats are. So our pet cats are actually doing just as much or more damage than feral cats in Australia. And that's why we all say keep your cats inside at night time. And it's a big worry. Um, I reckon personally cats are probably the number one threat to native species in Australia. Um, there's been a study done recently on feral animals um, worldwide. Um, and in Australia, our number one threat to, to, to our native species and extinction are invasive species. So we're talking cats, goats, um, donkeys, all of those. I personally think the worst of these is the feral cat. Um, incredibly cryptic, incredibly hard to see. I've seen them at places where they're really, really rare birds that are on the verge of extinction, just sleeping around their nests. Um, so the golden-shouldered parrot up in Cape York went out once at night. I, I knew there was a feeding station for these golden-shouldered parrots. I looked around with my headlamp, picked up cat eye shine within a minute. Here's one just sleeping on an ant bed, ready to rock and roll. So really scary. Um, each day in Australia, uh, cats kill over 3.1 million mammals, 1.8 million reptiles, 1.3 million birds every day. That is every day. So really, really scary. Um, unfortunately, um, they also don't. So one of the benefits we often think of is that they're going to suppress native populations of rabbits, rats and mice, so the feral ones. Unfortunately, that just provides a food source for them to flourish. So in bad years... Remember, in bad years, or in average years, sorry, 2.8 million cats exist in Australia. In a good year where there's lots of rain, lots of prey animals, that, anim that number can boost quite easily. And so the mortality rate of kittens goes down. So lots more ki kittens survive because there's lots more food around. Cat populations go up. Our native animals really suffer. So yeah, these guys are bad. Take your kitty cats inside at night, folks. That's the takeaway. Camels. Yep, camels are feral in Australia. Uh, turns out we have one of the best breeding stocks in the world. Um, I think there was a bit of a, an issue with disease uh, in the Saudi Arabian populations over there. And they were actually using our genetic stock in Australia to repopulate and, and take some of theirs back over there. So quite a cool little thing that we have in Australia. Unfortunately, they, they're a bit of a water hog as well um, in cities out, uh, in, sorry, in towns out west when water's low in the in outside in towns uh, or outside in um, the rural areas they actually come into town and they've been known to just swamp around taps and, and just annoy public areas so there's quite often culling um, programs for these as well aerial culling programs but their numbers are in the tens of thousands in Australia Buffalo have a look at the booty on this guy can shake it can twerk it Dangerous animal, uh, if you ever surprise one or shoot one, um, hunters know that these guys are, you know, they can they can turn on you very quickly. Look at the size of his horns, they are huge. Um, but these guys are quite impressive. Uh, brought in from Asian, so these are Asian water buffalo. 
now lots of them in the top end. So Northern Territory, you see a lot of them, some in Queensland and Western Australia as well on the top end. But um, these guys, similar effect for pigs. Um, lots of trampling, they love to dig, they need to be in cool water so they wallow, um, but lots of effects as well. And this guy here, a lot of people don't recognize him, but that's actually a Bantang. So he is a uh, essentially an Asian cow. You can tell uh, by the stripes on his bum there and on his legs. Um, in Asia, their populations are actually struggling a bit, and we have them here. So it's always good to have those reserve populations somewhere when we're talking about animal populations suffering on other continents. Um, so really cool that we've got them here, but they are hunted and they are feral. So similar impacts to buffalo, pigs, and we also have obviously feral cattle in Australia, which cause a lot of problems as well. All right, let's go to pigs. Yeah. All right, now this is one of my favorite photos. I took this back in the day in uh, Charters Towers, actually. Um, so I was running a program out there. We were trialing um, pulse baiting, so aerial baiting from aeroplanes with uh, a, a, a toxin called 1080. It's got, a, it's got a really bad rap, but it's got a bad rap because a lot of people don't understand it. Once we start to explain what it does and how it works, it's actually um, when used appropriately and properly, it is a very, um, yeah, it's a very good toxin um, to eradicate populations of feral pigs and cats. Now, one of the reasons it gets a bad rap is the 1080 toxin is derived from a lot of our native plant species here. So Gigi is one of the big ones, um, but lots of native plant species make up this 1080 toxin. Now, when you take that toxin overseas, um, it impacts native animals differently. In Australia, quite a lot of our native animals have adapted to that toxin or to the plants that make up that toxin. So they have essentially a natural resistance to it. You take this toxin to America and it's really, really potent to some of their native animals. Um, and so over there, because there's more Americans than there are Australians, 1080 gets a really bad rap and that comes back to Australia. Now that program I mentioned earlier about um, the dingo collars with a 1080 in them to reduce goat populations, there was a essentially a, a survey that went overseas to America overnight, got 100,000 signatures to shut it down. And it was simply because Americans don't understand 1080 because it doesn't work as well over there. In Australia, most, so many of our native um, animals have a good resistance to the 1080 toxin that we use it to control feral animals like pigs, um, cats and dogs and some other things as well. Excuse me. So this was a, uh, a pig actually coming into a feeding site. That's the the feeding site behind us here is that bin. It's a couple of plants tied together. We used to put fermented grain in there and the pig would come in for a feed. And eventually once we had enough pigs coming in, we would put grain in there. Um, I'll bring up the photo to show you what I mean, but um, here we go. So this is after weeks and weeks of monitoring this site. I think this was after about two months actually. We put in 1080 baited grain. It was dyed green so people don't eat it. Um, and there's so many questions around this, but essentially you would have to eat something like three kilos of this grain for whatever reason to get sick. Now, three kilos of that fermented, disgusting smelling corn grain, and you were going to eat it is ridiculous. So it's pretty safe. Um, it's dyed green. Birds don't like it. Birds, most of our native birds wouldn't eat enough anyway for, for them to be affected toxically. Um, but pigs do. Pigs have a lower resistance to it. So... That's what we do there anyway. I'll go back to the original image here. There's our possum buddy. There we go. So yeah. And this is just a cool picture that we got on the time-lapse camera of this possum having a bit of a dig at this pig. Um, it was pretty cool. Yeah. Morning, uh, morning Jaden, Wilfred, Ellie, Pete and Bev. How are you? Hey, Brett. How are you, mate? Brett's over in Bhutan at the moment. Flying helicopters for royals and whatnot. Crazy, crazy, crazy. All right, let's go further through the story. Um, I'm going to go through about uh, 40 or 50 different images of feral pigs here, and I'm just going to talk about different things as we go. I'll bring up uh, different stories, but um, yeah, feral pigs, pretty bad for Australia. Um, so many different impacts. Actually, let's talk about their impacts. So feral pigs in Australia, they in they increase uh, erosion because they have hooves. They have to dig. Um, their sweat glands are barely functional. So for feral pigs to maintain a good temperature in Australia, especially tropical Australia where it's really hot, they have to drink lots of water and they have to wallow. So they dig the soil. Um, they create little isolated pockets of water. And what that does is it actually increases the temperature of those little pockets. Um, and that increases the evaporation rate. Now I'm going to try and pull up a... Um, 
a diagram here that a mate did for us back in the day. Here we go. All right, have a look at this. Now, what we're looking at here, uh, the orange line is the average temperature of the larger water body, so the lake. So that's the temperature of the lake um, throughout the day. It varies a little bit, but the variation is only between 23, 25 degrees Celsius. So only about two degrees of variation. Now he's put temperature sensors, and this is a bloke down in JCU um, named Nathan Walton, really good uh, freshwater ecologist, does some great work. He's put also temperature loggers in um, pugs or wallows where pigs have gone, they've dug it up. Now, if you look at the top of that image, you can see um, some of the isolated water pockets where there's a, a pig wallow. That water temperature goes crazy high, which increases your evaporation rate. So instead of being um, 23 to 25, let's say, that goes from about 22 all the way up to nearly 32 degrees. So the variation is so much higher and that temperature of those, those little isolated pockets of water gets a lot higher as well. So it increases the evaporation rate, which essentially dries your water holes so much faster. So feral pigs in Australia are leading to faster drying times of all of our wetlands. Absolutely bizarre. So they're really, really risky. Um, for areas that need these water holes. And that's why a lot of uh, cattle station farmers rely on troughs so pigs can't get in, etc., etc. So naughty, naughty, naughty pigs. There we go, where were we? Beautiful. Uh, let's look at a couple of their other impacts. Uh, so evaporation we talked about, turbidity. So when they're digging up in these wetlands, um, we'll go through, let's see if we can find, here we go. Here's a great picture of a pig. Now you can actually see a splash mark here. Um, just in front of that pig where he's dug up where he was and he's throwing it now their, their necks are incredibly muscly really really strong their shoulders are quite muscly as well but he's flung that bit of soil all the way you know that's probably about a meter away from him so that just shows the power of their their neck muscles and, and their their head now he's digging in there for you can see the plant in front of us there that's called bulgaroo uh asian water chestnut um iliocaris dulcis it's called you can actually eat that, it kind of tastes like a uh, kind of a coconut, quite small on the bottom, but on the bottom there's a little rhizome. That's what he's digging for there. He will eat that all day long. Now I'll show you pictures later on of this, this um, Iliocaris, this um, chestnut. It's essentially a water sedge. Uh, magpie geese need it to nest, they also eat it, and so do so many other animals. Um, this plant also, when it dries up, when this lagoon dries, it goes from green to brown to dead, and it it has this massive mat over what used to be the lagoon. Now, when fires pass through the, the, the landscape, um, which is normal and which is okay, um, that's fine. But what happens is um, normally, you know, if a fire passes through the landscape, it's going to burn all the grass. And then what will be left behind are these Iliocaris, this water chestnut, folded over in the middle of the landscape and it won't get burnt. And what that does is it provides really, really important habitat for small birds, small mammals, marsupials, rodents, all sorts of things to hide in there and have a cover because all the other grass has burnt and gone away. Now what pigs do is they dig up all of that and it's gone, it doesn't exist anymore. So now after fires come through, there is nowhere for all these small marsupials, mammals, uh, rodents, all these other animals to hide because the fires come through and burnt the, the landscape as well. And there's no Iliocaris for these, um, for these animals to hide in because the pigs have dug it up already. So really really um, bad impact there in terms of um, re reducing habitat for other animals um, so as you can see there too the water that he's in a lot of these lagoons used to be crystal clear if you go there early in the year we've flown over in uh, let's say march april and the landscape is just pristine it's green all the water's clear it's absolutely beautiful um, you fly, fly over at that time of the year come two months later the water is muddy, it's dirty. Um, if they're on creeks or riverbeds or areas where water flows then into a river system that then flows either to the east or the west, especially if it's to the east, that water's dirty. It's carrying a huge sediment load. So lots and lots of soil and mud in it. That goes out to the reef. All that sediment uh, rests on the coral, stops that zooxanthellae um, that's in the coral from being able to photosynthesize, photosynthesize properly and essentially it can kill the coral. So pigs on the land are affecting the turbidity of the water that flows into the creeks, increases turbidity and sediment load that lands on corals out in the ocean, and it can affect our reef ecosystems as well. So an animal that got introduced to Australia hundreds of years ago has an impact on our reefs today. Now that's a huge one. That's really, really big and really important to consider.
Now, they also affect our plant and animal populations for various reasons. They, they predate some animals. They compete with animals for resources, so for food, habitat. Um, but they also disturb the area. So this guy's disturbing the area. He's not only disturbing the Iliocaris there, he's digging up worms, he's eating snails, um, he's destroying frog habitat, uh, marsupial habitat, like I mentioned, bird habitat. Um, there's so many different impacts in that one picture that's going on. Now, another big impact they have is they pose a huge threat to the biosecurity of Australia. Now, feral pigs are throughout all of Australia, they're ungulates, um, and they're quite close to um, cattle as well. Now, there's a disease overseas called foot and mouth disease, and it is knocking at the door of Australia through the Torres Strait through Papua New Guinea. If that was to come down through the Torres Strait, get into Australia, it would spread like wildfire through Australia, um, through feral pigs and feral cattle and the other cattle uh, stocks that are already in Cape York. It would spread so quick, we wouldn't be able to stop it. The losses would be so debilitating, people have likened it to the effect of World War II on Australia. Um, it would have maybe, uh, what was the figure? I think somewhere around $100 million of damage um, plus stock losses, it would wipe out 70% of native cattle, uh, of our, of our, sorry, not native, so of our cattle stock in Australia. 70% of our cattle stock would be lost if foot and mouth disease got into Australia. So these guys are actually also vectors for disease to get into Australia. So big problems there, and that's why there's big biosecurity um, programs in Cape York. And Cape York, with the research we've done over the years, uh, we think is has the highest density of pigs in Australia. Um, we've looked at other places everywhere, and other people might claim it, um, but I, I strongly believe we have found some of the densest populations of feral, feral pigs in Australia are in Cape York. Excuse me. <clears throat> All righty. Here you go. So this is a, a pretty typical hunting shot. I'm a bow hunter. I've been bow hunting since I was about 11. I've seen this exact image a hundred times. A pig's digging up some bulgaroo, Iliocaris, chestnut, whatever you want to call it. Um, and we were just trying to film um, for a TV, uh, for a TV doco and a news doco. Um, so this is one of the images that they end up using. Actually, let's have a look at that. We'll take a quick break here from from my voice, and I'll play you a video that Nine News did a few years ago on a project we were running up in Cape York with feral pigs and turtles, um, and that'll give us a, a good bit of context on things. So. Landscape tarnished by a destructive pest. Feral <coughs> pigs run wild in Western Cape York, decimating natural habitat. They also have a taste for turtle eggs. Without any feral pig intervention, so no feral pig control, 32,000 hatchlings die. They don't make it into the ocean. Each breeding season, an entire generation of offspring are wiped out from the coastline of Aratine. Six years ago, scientists began engaging traditional landowners to reverse the toll. We're not just focusing on the management, not just focusing on the science, we're trying to put those two things together. Aerial shooting and baiting help control plague-like populations, but it's simple construction netting that's reversing decades <coughs> of damage. Because we're working so remote, we don't often have complicated solutions, so we try and work on what's really efficient and effective. Now, more than 75% of turtle nests are surviving, including the endangered hawksbill turtle. As scientists move out, still the indigenous ranges remain on the ground. When my children grow up, they can come out, look at the country, and it's beautiful for them. Fighting a pest for generations to come. Sasha Passy, Nine News. A pristine landscape. Awesome, so... Um, a lot of what you saw in that video was some of the footage we took over the years. We did aerial surveys with helicopters. We, uh, we also did a lot of aerial shooting. So in four years, we shot 9,669 pigs. Now, that's no exaggeration on numbers. That was counted using an iPad application. Every pig was counted correctly. That is not an, an exaggeration on numbers. 9,669 pigs in four years. Now, their numbers are huge. And aerial shooting is a great way to do it. But one of the things we learned was it doesn't matter um, if you kill one or two or cull one or two thousand pigs. Um, if you're trying to pr protect a particular resource, some, something like uh, turtle nests, for example. If you're trying to protect nests on the beach, it doesn't matter if you kill a thousand pigs. It's that you get the right hundred. Um, so we, what we actually found, and I'll show you a graph here. 
Uh, we're going to go to graphs now, lovely little graph. But here we go. So I was talking about, um, earlier I was talking about that 1080 baiting. Now this is how it worked. Early on in the 14th of June, early on, it took ages to get pigs on. Now what's happening is early in the season, pigs are still digging up the lagoons. They're eating that water sedge. They already have all the food they need. They didn't need our supplement feeding that we were trying to get them into the feeding stations. We had cameras watching and I'll go through some of those pictures soon. They didn't need all that food because they already had all that bulgaroo, all the snails that they needed, everything else that their protein requirements were satisfied. As it comes to about July, a lot of those coastal lagoons started to dry out and they started to shift looking for more food. They started to move, their home ranges expanded. Now a male, a male feral pig, his home range is about 43 kilometers squared. A female is about 10 to 20 kilometers squared. So their home range has changed. They started exploring more, looking for more food. Now this spike we start to see here is that time when they're starting to look for more food, looking for more protein. And so they're going out and they're coming across our feeding stations. They eat some of it and go, hey, that's pretty good. I wouldn't mind some of that tomorrow. Come on. And so we go and fill it up. After we see them, they come back the next day and they start smashing that food. Every day they're coming in. And so here we've actually recorded across 20 feeding stations right along the beach um, where these pigs are coming and how many of them are coming. Now on the, I think, 27th of July, 28th of July, we put 1080 bait down. And what you see directly after that is a massive reduction in the visits to sites, which is correlated with the reduction of the pigs around. So a lot of those pigs were culled. We found quite a lot of them. It reduced the population. Now it only killed, we estimated about 120 or so pigs, but it was the exact pigs that were leaving the coastal lagoons, going through the dune vegetation towards the beach to start digging up turtle nests. So it didn't matter that we killed a thousand pigs in the swamps all in the big area, up in the timberlands, up in the ridgelands. It mattered that we killed <clears throat> the 100 pigs that were transitioning from coastal lagoons to the beach to look for turtle eggs to supplement their protein requirements. Um, so it's not all about numbers. A lot of the time it's about the technique you use and what you're doing and where you're targeting and the right the right animals, so the right individuals. Um, so that's a, that's a really interesting takeaway there. I'll show you some of these feeders now. So here we can see a pig. This is in Lakefield on a study I was doing. I did my honours there, wrote this... Uh, pretty big fancy book uh, this is my this is my honors project my thesis um, since then I've written uh, manuals that have been used in the government across Australia um, along with uh, guys in JCU James Cook University um, Chop Water down in Townsville uh, CSIRO um, Balkanu APN and Cullen ranges as well so lots of people helped us write um, actually this one just here uh, really cool little handbook anyone can get their hands on that anyone that's in the feral pig management industry or wants to know more about pigs can request a copy of this and we can at least send it in PDF. Otherwise, we can give you links to order a printed version for yourself. But these are really great. So you can see here, this pig, I would presume he's either digging for bulbs or rhizomes deep or mussels. So he's digging for something deep in the, deep in the soil. Um, similar picture, some pigs sleeping, some pigs resting, some pigs feeding. All right, so here we go. This is one of the pig feeders we trialed. This is a PVC feeder. It worked okay, but because we were using a wet feed, a lot of the time it got blocked up and it didn't work so well. Um, this is a massive pig. He ended up dying a few a few days later. He's actually alive in this picture. And I've got a picture of a ding, that dingo walking right up to him and just about nosing him. But I reckon he must have been pretty old because he's on his way out. It looks like he might have lost vision in one of his eyes as well. But a few days after this, he actually passes away in that little waterhole. <clears throat> pigs love water they like i said before they don't have um really functional sweat glands so they have to thermoregulate by either wallowing or being in the water um, being a black animal as well they absorb a lot of heat if they're in the sun and so a few of the things that really affect where pigs are, are food water and shelter those three things will just about determine where pigs are now there's a guy called justin perry from csro he's an incredible oncologist i would say one of the best in australia He's also really good at statistics and mapping. Um, and he started mapping pig uh, lo uh, distribution based on the availability of those three resources. He can predict roughly what good country is for feral pigs and where they're going to be. So here's, have a look at that. That's the same lagoon, uh, July as opposed to May. So in May, they've started to hit it. 
in July, it's pretty already chumped. Like all of that water cover, all of that vegetation in the water's gone. So many different things in that lagoon have changed. He's digging underwater there for water lily bulbs, absolutely smashing it. Uh, that for me, uh, and a lot of guys I know, is a beautiful situation if you're a bow hunter. Pig's head is underwater, he can't hear. You've got cover. Um, yeah, just lovely. I shouldn't say that too much, but yeah, do love bow hunting. All right, so you can see the shadow of the helicopter there. We were out on, I think, an aerial survey on this occasion, and these are some pigs running through this wetland there. You can see up here, that would normally be bright green, and you can see that there's previous damage from feral pigs in here where they've gone through and they've eaten a lot of this bull gruel Iliocaris um, chestnut, the, the seed of it, or the, the nut of it, and they're just decimating that wetland. So that wetland that once once it was dried would provide habitat and cover for those small animals. Once this dries up now, it's just going to be a muddy wasteland and there's going to be no cover left for those animals. Here's a shot of about, we counted, uh, this was on an aerial survey. This is one side of the helicopter. I'm not sure if I included the other side, but there was about 180 pigs that we could see on either side of us here. So one side there was about 100 and then on the other there was about 80 banger. So pigs absolutely everywhere. And this is this is Cape York, just chock-a-block, populations run wild. And a lot of the time it's a um, it's a variety of landscapes in one area that supports a really healthy ecosystem um, or, or a really healthy population of feral pigs. So things like cover, as you can see there, and then food out in the, out in the open. Here's one, so this is that water sedge again. Now, our magpie geese, lots of other water birds, they rely on this food, on this plant for food, as well as nesting habitat. So they fold over the water sedge on top of each other and lay their eggs on top of it. Pigs digging this up, it's all gone. Um, there's no food source or a nesting source for these pigs. Same with water lilies, the pigs love water lilies. He's gonna dig it up. He's gonna dig up those bulbs, the water lilies, that the, the comb crested jacana, the Jesus bird, the lily hopper. Um, he's not going to be able to lay, lay his eggs on there anymore either. So, yeah, he, this guy, he's digging for the Eleocaris, the, the Bulgaroo said you now. Here's a picture of just a bunch of pigs running through the bush. I've got a video of this one I'll show you in a minute, but here's another bloke. Now, this isn't a lagoon. This is actually a river. So this is probably a, a freshwater a part of the river in the middle of Cape York with water lilies in it. And he's got a water lily, water lily in his mouth that he's bringing back to the shore. Now, pigs are smart enough that they know if they stay in the water in croc country for too long, they'll get eaten. So a pig will go into the water, dig up a water lily bulb, rip it out, take it back to the bank and eat it, and then go back to the water to, to find another one, bring it back to the bank to eat it. So they're incredibly intelligent. They are smart enough to know if he stays in the water, he's going to get chomped. Um, there's a couple of uh, Brolga here that he's digging up uh, the territory of and they're just watching on going, mate, what are you doing? You're ruining it for us. Another bloke, like, you can't even see this guy's eyes. Have a look at that. You can't even see his eyes. He's digging up all the sedges. He's just a mess. Look at him. What's he doing? What's he thinking? He may have died that one, by the way. Pretty good image of more damage by feral pigs reducing that cover again. And this one, how's that? Now you can see pigs over here. There's one guy just digging there. This whole area now, as this is dried out, so what happens is as the lagoon dries, the pigs often follow the recession of the water line and they'll forage as they go until it gets shallow enough for them to feed everywhere. Now, like I said before, this whole area would normally be, once it's dried, a cover, a, a, a habitat for other animals. The pig's digging it up, and as you can see over here, there's barely any cover left for other animals once this is all dry. So they've just destroyed, they've in increased the evaporate, evaporation rate of this lagoon by all of those little separated water holes where the, wa the water temperature is going higher and the evaporation rates are going higher. So he's essentially increased the speed that this water hole has dried up. He's removed uh, cover and protection for animals in the dry season once this is all dry. He's competed with food sources and nesting habitat for other animals as well. Cheeky fellow. So here's another, look at that. That's absolutely shocking. In that photo, you can see in the middle, there's a there's a, a jabberoo just walking through. But that's a pretty typical photo of a lagoon in Cape York. It's just absolutely smashed. And zoom in so you can see a bit more of it. But yeah, it's just trolloped. And here you can see that recession. So the, the pigs are following the recession of the waterline. And they're just digging it up as they go now. That normally, 
So in here, that should normally be all that green stuff on the right, but the pegs are just working their way through it and they're disappearing fast. Uh, these are just water lines where you can see pegs have walked through. You can track them like this, but this is a field of bulgaroo. So this is what it should look like. And then over there on the edges, you can start to see some of that digging happen. Um, as this season goes on and that gets shallower, there's going to be nothing left. It's just going to be mud. When it's dry, that should be a mat. That should be a habitat for those small animals. There's a good example of what they do. There's a cricket pitch in there that's just destroyed. Pretty sure there's a pig in that photo somewhere. Where is he? Um, yeah, there's a pig in there somewhere. I can't remember where he was though. But that's destroyed. That's absolutely smashed. Here's a lagoon or a dam that's dried up. There's a pig wallowing in there. There's pigs feeding. There's horses. There's cattle. That's an amazing image of three invasive species using a water resource that our native animals should be. Now, you don't see any wallabies in there. You don't see any marsupials or birds in there because there's already three animals um, using that water resource and, and tainting it. Now, that should be crystal clear. It's got an algae growing on top. It's probably got bacteria in there. But that is not a healthy water hole. That's not what they should look like. Here's that image again of the 1080 bait that we used. These are the kind of images we get before we baited. So pigs upon pigs upon pigs coming into these feeding stations. They would even sleep there. They would suckle. How crazy is that? This sow is sleeping. They're living at this feeding site now. So they remember they need shelter. They need food and they need water to live. Right here, she's got shelter and food, so all she has to do to move is to go and find water, and then she comes back and lives here. So she's got a litter of, let's see if we can count, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven pigs there. So let's talk about fecundity, so the reproductive ability of feral pigs. Now, I mentioned today I was going to tell you about a similarity between pigs and rabbits. Now, that similarity is that pigs would be probably the most reproductive animal uh, in Australia, in terms of how how highly reproductive they are, they're about as close as it gets to rabbits. Rabbits are incredibly, incredibly reproductive, and pigs are a step behind them, but not far. So this sow here, she takes about four months in gestation, so about four months for, that, for her to grow the piglets inside of her, and then she'll give birth. On average, four to six piglets per litter, up to ten. In a good year, she can wean two litters. So in a good season, she can wean two litters in 12 to 15 months. Two litters in 12 to 15 months. Now, they are reproductive at 25 to 30 kilos or six months old. Around six months, they get they get to that, age, that, that size. But at 25 to 30 kilos, regardless of age, they are reproductive. So this pig here um has given birth to these let's say the sex ratio is a bit male biased in cape yorks from from studies that we've done so about 1.7 males to one female um it may vary it may get closer to parity but um in cape york from studies we've done 1.7 to 1 um so let's say about a third of that litter is going to be females in six months time a third of those are going to be re reproductive and having their own babies as well and in 12 to 15 months in a good season they can have two litters weaned with up to about 10 in a letter. Now I'll show you a brilliant diagram just to, uh, uh, rather a diagram a table. Uh, where are we? Here we go. So here's all that data. 112 to 114 days. Uh, so yeah, just under four months of gestation. Um, 4.6, sorry, 4.6 to 8 um, is the average litter, up to 10. Sexually reproductive at 25 to 30 kilos, weaned at two to three months, and then they're straight back into it again. Um, so less than three months return of estrus. So within a few months, they are breeding and feeding again. Two weaned litters in 12 to 15 months in good conditions. There's your sex ratio. Um, their home range, so a male home range is about 43 kilometers squared, 19 for females. Now, uh, the, the way uh, pigs work, um, actually, I'll get into that in a minute. I'll talk about it on, when we've got a picture of a mob. Um, their lifespan is about six years. So if you come across a pig with big tusks, he is old. They only live maybe four to six in the wild. Um, once they get to six, they're, they're dying. So they're not incredibly old animals. Um, but they, yeah, they, they, they do go through enough dry season that you don't want to eat a pig that's four to six years old. He's been eating carry-on and all sorts of other things. And I'll show you a pretty gross video soon um, that'll, that'll talk about some of that uh, as well. 
Males are bigger on average, 70 to 100, 100 kilos, as opposed to females, 40 to 70 kilos. It's a bit of an example there on, on how populations can grow, uh, but we don't need to go through that. All you need to know is that they can reproduce incredibly fast. Go back to this image here, and we're just going to look at a mob. All right, here we go. So mobs are also called sanders. Sanders are pegs. The hierarchy, the social uh, structure is usually female-led. So your mobs and feral pigs are all female uh, orientated. The sows uh, have their litters and they, reproduce, they, they, they raise their litters together. Multiple sows and a mob. And you'll get young boars in there as well. Now what, what often happens is uh, uh, older boars will join the mobs to reproduce, to mate. Um, and they'll often kick out younger boars that are, they get, that are getting up to a challenging, uh, challenging stage. Those younger boars will leave the mob and they can form kind of social pairs um, or mating pairs. And so sometimes you have uh, small male mobs like two, two or three um, that are siblings that grow up. And quite often like your, your boars, especially your older boars alone, or they're, they're, they're two. And they, was, they were actually siblings together. So you get two boars that are together um, as older pigs, four to six years, whatever, that have grown up as siblings and they stay together in that group. But your mobs are generally always females and young males uh, and the, the older males just join for mating here's a, another image of just a massive lagoon destroyed by the pigs another one now this gets trashed pretty quickly more and more pigs um, so one of the ways we monitored uh, if a lagoon had impact or not was with uh, these measuring tapes they were called activity transects you'd lay one of these out a week and you'd sit and uh, as the water line recedes and see how active pigs were in that area it's another image of one of the best rugby players in Cape York, uh, Dylan Creek, just um, doing some field work. And it looks like, yeah, Gabriel behind him too. So Gabriel's a close mate of mine, does welcome to the country. Uh, another amazing tee up there, an amazing rugby player as well. Jeez, you don't want to get tackled by those lads. Um, Dylan would be like Greg Inglis on the field. He was that guy that you sent on to get a try when you were behind. All right, so we used to do a bit of surveying, as I mentioned before, and these are just the booms that we had out, so feral surveying. Jim Mitchell, Australia's leading feral pig researcher, great dude. Um, Dylan Creek and the helicopter there, so I used to do a lot of flying in these R44s with the booms out the side. And this is the app we used. We developed an app. Um, Stuart McDonald down in JCU, great guys, developed some great apps for us, UG Media. Um, but this is a feral animal monitoring app and it let us do it a lot easier than rather than writing down or recording with a voice recorder. In the iPad, we just punched this in, how many we saw and in what, what class on that boom. Um, so on what number on that boom that comes out the side of the helicopter there. And this is the kind of data we get. We'd fly 50 k's up, turn around 50 k's back and your data would be represented roughly like this. Now here is, uh, we're talking about aerial shooting now. Uh, we'll zoom in here. But this is a map of an area, a bunch of aerial shoots overlaid. So there's your helicopter tracks, your different colored dots, uh, different different shoots on different days. Um, but there's a lot of dead pigs in there. So each one of those dots is a dead pig. And quite a lot of those are concentrated near the coast and the swamps. For anyone that's interested in pig behavior, they are crepuscular. So there's a big word, folks. Crepuscular means they are active at dawn and dusk primarily. So you can see a couple of big spikes there around 6 p.m., and 6 a.m. during the day it's really hot you'll see them out but a lot of the time they're sleeping or if they're feeding it's on the water and at night they're, they're kind of active they're a little bit active as well but much more during the day during the day when it's hot especially between 10 and 2 they're resting and then dawn and dusk they're most active so that's when we coincided our our shooting time so same thing at another site um, hot during the day at night time they're more active now we use drones quite a bit as well. So here's some drone footage. We started using these to monitor the, the wetlands. You can see some fauna survey plots in there um, and different little things to the side. So they, they were, drones became quite handy because the rangers could take them out and they could analyze for us. We could, we could essentially analyze how much of that, that lagoon was destroyed by pigs rather than going out and dropping a one meter squared box and then recording um, what was in there. So in this image here, uh, Justin Perry, he developed a way of analyzing that drone image to represent how much of that was destroyed by feral pigs. And a, lot, and a lot of that lagoon there, it is destroyed by pigs. So like I said before, that should be a mat of dried bulgaroo. And now it's not, it's just chewed up by them. Uh, we've been through that one already. Here's a lagoon, so a comparison. So 
there are a lot of control methods with feral pigs. We've got ground shooting, aerial shooting, trapping, uh, baiting. Um, but there's also one called exclusion fencing, which we use a lot and is permanent. It has a lifetime effect. So here, the top image, I'll show you a video of this later. Uh, but the top image is pigs let in. And then a year later, uh, this, this other image was taken after exclusion fencing was put in. So pigs couldn't get any more. And that lagoon bounced back amazingly. So that's a really graphical representation of how, how much damage the pigs are doing on these lagoons. And this is the kind of thing we were doing. So one side we were fencing off for all animals. So pigs, cattle and horses were excluded. And, then, and that was using like your mesh fencing. And then on the other side, we just used three barbed fencing where pigs could get in, but the other two couldn't. So you could, have, you could compare the effects of presence or absence of pigs. And essentially, if your control methods were working well, both sides of that lagoon, or if you had two different lagoons, both of those lagoons should be exactly the same because your control program is removing pigs and there's no pigs anyway. Um, so interesting way of looking at it, but yeah, cool, cool little study. We've looked at our plugging thing here. Now, before I talked about feral pigs digging up uh, turtle nests, so this was a case in Cape York. In 2012, every turtle nest was eaten mostly by feral pigs. 101 by feral pigs, three by dogs, and one by one by people. And that's, that's okay. The last two numbers, that's pretty standard. That's natural. The next year, after that 1080 baiting, we reduced predation from 100% down to 24%. So 76% of nests survived after one year of that chemical baiting, which is phenomenal. That turns things around. Now, potentially, pigs have been in Cape York since the mid to late 1880s um, when Queensland started to get populated, and that's when pigs would have been introduced and spread. So we've essentially had 160 years of feral pigs digging up turtle nests, having predation at 100%. And so what we think is those nests that used to be uh, highly with a high fecundity, lots of nests, uh, uh, a thing called arabata where there would be mass nesting on nights where lots of turtles would come up, that has potentially gone now because those following generations aren't there. So potentially for 160 years in Cape York, some of those beaches have had up to and close to 100% turtle nest predation until intervention in 2012, 2013 and sometimes earlier in other places. Uh, and so this is the natural progression of things as well. So in 20, 2012, the biggest problem was pigs. The next year we removed pigs and it was pigs and dogs, half, half. Most of the nests survived. Next year, guess what happens? The natural progression goes on and you get problems with dogs digging up the nests. We took care of dogs. What happens the next year? Um, pigs and dogs are a problem, but goannas became a problem as well. Sorry, so the, the next year goannas are a big thing. But there's always these problems that are compounding, so... Um, in that 2014 where there's lots of pigs again, that was one individual pig that we just couldn't get. So one individual pig sometimes can create huge problems. These are some of the things. I did a diet study in 2010 on feral pigs. So these are snail opercula on the left. So the, the little case when the snail goes back inside his shell, that little thing that protects him, that's called an opercula. And you'd find hundreds of these in some of the pig stomachs. So eating lots and lots of snails. In this other image, we've got beetle larvae and potentially there was centipedes, although I'm not sure there's centipedes in this image, but there was lots of beetle larvae. So they were eating beetles. Um, I found croc skin. Didn't find frogs, but then no one to eat frogs as well. I found a feather that had a bit of meat attached. So they're eating any, anything that has a, a, an olfactory cue, a smell cue. Here you go. So here's our data. Uh, this isn't the complete data by the look of it. Um, but here's some of our data over the years. So um, in some shoots, it, it, over a matter of days, we were shooting 900 pigs, 1,000 pigs. Over the years, we end up shooting 9,669 pigs. So there must be one shoot missing on this. Um, but yeah, there was a lot. There was a lot of pigs shot over the years. And that's if anyone wants to know if you're a hunter. Uh, remember that their spine sits quite low and their heart and lungs are quite low. So a cheeky little one in there for any hunters watching. Um, there. Uh, so pigs actually have a, a kind of a keratinous shoulder. So the males have a keratinous shoulder. Keratin is what our hair and nails are made of. Um, so very strong, but their shoulder blades are, are packed so they can battle kind of with each other. Um, very hard. They've also got a shoulder blade, which you can kind of see in that image, that protects their organs. And so it's highly protected. So their, their heart sits in just behind that, as do their lungs. So quite low in their body. So quite a lot of the time, if you hit them too high, um, yeah, no go. Sorry, mate. And this is quite interesting. 
we used to have to age the feral pigs that we shot um, when we we're doing diet studies and so you can actually age pigs up to uh, six years using what's called dental eruption and wear now teeth erupt at different stages in their life and once you get to all of their teeth being erupted now if you have a look at this column here um, this last column you've got the last molar m3 so if you look at this you've got our, our three molars all erupted and there's a rough, there's a, a wear over the years. So you can tell if the pig's got really, really worn flat molars. Um, he is probably at the end of his life. He's about six years old. Um, and so you can tell by how, so this this pig here is about two years old and his third molars just, just started erupting. And by the time he is what looks to be about three years old, that last molar has finally erupted. So you can actually age a pig. If you look inside their mouth, if anyone wants this, I'll send it to you. I'll send you the paper. But you can age a pig when you open its jaws based on its teeth, which is phenomenal. All right, that must be the end of those. So let's go. Let's go through a few videos. Um, I might just have a look at what what else we've missed there on pigs. So, yes, they did um, descend from our uh, from domestic pigs. So Sasgrofa. I'll just put up another picture of a pig there that might uh, be pretty representative. Uh, this one will do. So they did descend from domestic pig Sarscropa, which essentially descended from wild uh, European and Asian pigs as well. So there's five species of pigs in the Sus genus. So Sarscropa is one of them. Um, some of their pigs we think may have originated from a couple other species as well, potentially. But Sarscropa is the feral pig of Australia, which, which came from essentially... Uh, domestic pig which eventually which originally came from uh, a wild pig anyway a European or Asian feral pig now they're a little bit different to the domestic pig you see their tails are straight they've got a mane quite a developed neck very developed shoulder big tusks um, when I say mane I mean hackles on the back and very hairy they're usually black but they can be black and white and they do have throwbacks to the old European wild boar with that stripy ginger and black um, look as well so very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, you can find throwbacks in nature quite often to that original domestic um, domestic um, descendant or ancestor rather. Um, so like I said before, they have a matriarchal social structure. So sows lead the mobs, um, five to 20 in a mob usually. Uh, their, their feeding habits, they are highly opportunistic omnivores. That means that they, uh, they're opportunistic. So they will take any opportunity to eat any food that they can take. They only have one stomach, so they can't digest grasses and cellulose materials like the ruminants, like cows can. Um, but they can they can digest so many other other plant species, um, and they've got any animal that they pretty much want to to eat, they can, um, and so many other 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 plants and animals as well. So they can dig up all your tubers, all your rhizomes. Uh, they they have adapted so well in Australia that their numbers we think are up around twenty five million. Um, now remember that the females have a higher protein content as well so their diet changes and they'll actually go further to find that protein content because they've got to grow young and lactate and other things so um, one of the interesting things that we've been doing lately as well is uh, we're starting to track pigs more so everyone's talking about oh my god you can get tracking devices in vaccines these days i wish i wish we had tracking devices that fit through the eye of a needle because it would have made all of our tracking programs so much easier. We would have been able to track thousands of feral pigs and we, pr we, we probably could have eradicated feral pigs in Australia if we had that ability. Um, in, in reality, the, the collars that we have to put on pigs are quite big and, and, and yeah, they're, they're, not, they're not the best. Um, Technology is getting better that they're starting to reduce in size, but there's a sensory array that TSRO now have in Cape York and the Territory that it allows us to monitor their movements and get a bit of a distribution map what they need so remember food shelter and water their three main requirements where you find those three in one area is going to be your highest chance of finding pigs um, but swamps in the cape are one of the best places um, water definitely being one of their main requirements all right let's go to some cool videos so i'm going to show you a video first up of a couple of rangers uh, putting a trap together so what they're what they're doing here is they are putting a stick in when the pig goes under that stick to feed he comes up that's our pig's feed he's going to bump that that's that's going to release the trap just like that i'm going to show you exactly what that looks like now in a video 
So you watch this pig on the left here. He's going to go underneath. And he's going to he's gonna lift that stick and he's going to trigger it. And he's going to trap the two that are on the inside. Boop. Bang, those two are trapped in there now. So we went back that day or the next day and got those guys. So that stick those lads just put in. Watch, th watch this piggy here. Watch that one that's moving. See how he goes under the stick and that stick just releases that trap. So that's how he got trapped there. So that's how a lot of our traps work. Let's go through a few more of our videos here. This is just a video of a, a bunch of pigs running. They didn't see me here actually and they were running right next to me. They came within about two or three meters of me just because I'd stayed dead still. Um, here's a video of a... I reckon there'd be nearly 50 pigs. This is in Cape York. Um, so this is on an aerial shooting program. That's a lot of pigs. Going back. Let's keep it on cycling. So here's how they feed. Here's this guy. He's digging up. Going right deep and just just smashing it. He's looking for the, the chestnut or the, the rhizome of that um, bulgaroo there. Here is a video of uh, just feral pigs running through that, that Bulgaru area. Uh, this is out in the open. Massive mobs of them in Cape York, though. Massive, massive mobs. Okay. All right, now we're going to go to it. This is a time lapse of that one of the lagoons you saw earlier where that pig and the dingo were together. But these are the kind of animals that come to a water uh, water source in Cape York in the later part of the season. So the November, November in Cape York is late dry. Um, this is one of the last water sources in the area. And you can see everything's coming in here to feed. Eventually a pig dies in that water source and taints it for everything else. Um, and so pigs, yeah, just, just a big problem. You can see the main, the main animals we're seeing here are pigs and cattle. Now we're nearly up. Uh, last few videos I want to show you though are of uh, there's that pig. He's died in the water. The water there now. Yeah, there you go. So up to December now. All right, next video I'm going to show you. I'll just pause it real quick if I can. So this is a horse that we found dead and we had to drag out. We put a camera on it to monitor it. Um, and what you're going to see here is how quickly, so look at the date there, 7th of September, how quickly a horse or a cow decays in Cape York um, and what comes in to eat it. Now, what you're going to see is mostly pigs, uh, dingoes, and birds. Um, and so this disappears in about seven days. Have a look at this. This is up online if anyone wants to see it. Tenth of September, three days. Four days. Five days. Six days. Seven days. So that thing's nearly gone and pigs are coming to it every day. Now I often say to people when they ask, yeah, so that's that's day eight now, and that's pretty much reduced to just bones and skin. That's it. Yeah, so let's just go back to that. I'll just um, I'll pause it on one of the last scenes there. Lots of pigs in there. But yeah, just bones. Now, a lot of the time we used to get asked to shoot pigs for ranges of guys up there, and they'll be like, get us the biggest, fattest pig. And quite often it was the worst one to get. If you're out and you're hunting, one of the big questions is what pigs... Um, do you want to, to eat? And it's always the youngest one. And if you can, a sow. Sows taste better. Get a young one, 30, 40 kilos. The reason being, they haven't had to survive four dry seasons, which is four dry seasons of food being limited and then resorting to, to food like uh, carry on, like this, this carcass here. Problem with that is anything that carries worms, um, each generation it goes through, each dry season it goes through, it increases the chance of it getting worms, liver flukes or all sorts of things so what we always do we'd always try and get a young pig uh you know within the first year of its life it hasn't seen a dry season and ideally you want to be eating them in the wet season when it's still healthy um as well as uh or some of the other things we'd look at their organs so you'd look at their liver and their kidneys for flecks and white spots and other things that might suggest 
that they have worms that you don't want. Um, good question there, Teresa. So Teresa's asked, is it possible to eventually eradicate all the pigs? No, no, it's not. Eradication is incredibly unlikely. Um, in in time, they'll probably assimilate into uh, part of our native ecosystem, I'd say. Um, the only way that we probably could eradicate them is with biological control. But because they're the same species as domestic pig, I, you wouldn't be able to. You wouldn't be able to use biological control um, for the threat that it'll ruin our, our, uh, our domestic pig industry in Australia. Yeah, no worries, uh, Diane. Good to see you, mate. Hey, Patty, how are you, bro? Hey, Katerina and Jerry. Ree and Jacob, how are you going? All right, just finishing up here, a couple more videos. I'm going to show you some time lapse of these lagoons in Cape York and we'll wrap up. So these are taken over time. You'll see here's this bulgaroo and it's just getting smashed. Matter of days. Next one. So here you'll see in January, it starts to fill up. It's going to go green. Everything grows back. March, it's looking really good. Water's going down now. April and May, things are in there already. You can see that water's getting dirty. Pigs have smashed it. It's dried up by August. So this is right on the, the coastline. And so pigs are looking at that time. They're looking for other protein sources then. Now, I think this year we'd fenced it. It grows back a lot better. Nothing comes in. And there's there's um, it actually retained quite a lot of its uh, vegetation the next year again was even better so after we fence this so there you go more water cover now and have a look at this here see is that oh no maybe that wasn't a year that we um this might have been one that was um not fenced sorry let's have a look yeah so that was a cattle one so pigs could get into this one my bad and you can see there because uh as it goes down the pigs have started to dig it up and I think from memory that behind those posts there was a, a pig protected area. All right, now this is one where, so the top lagoon, I'll just go back to the start and I'll talk about this one. These are two lagoons that right next to each other. The top lagoon uh, is now pig fenced, um, but not at this stage. So this is still when pigs could get in. After this, we pig fenced it. The bottom one allows pigs. So watch the difference in, in sites over time. Top, protected from pigs, bottom allows pigs. Isn't that huge? So one dries up so much faster than the other. And the difference in time, in terms of how it recovers is entirely different. Look at the top one, water lilies all through it. Entirely different. So let's play that again real quick and then we'll wrap it up. So in, the, in its first year, it's got okay vegetation cover coming back. The other one starts to get smashed. The water dispidity goes up. Dries out faster. Wet season about to hit. Fills up again. The other one's still turbid. Now have a look here. I'll just try and pause it there. Let's go back a bit. So water has hit. The water in January in the wet season is still dirty in that bottom one. And the top one, vegetation's growing well, the bottom one, barely even establishing. Have a look at the difference there. So that, that's what pigs are doing to wetlands in Australia. Phenomenal. All right, folks, so that's, that's about it. Um, I think we've pretty much summed it up. I'm just looking at uh, my notes to see if I've missed anything, but that's, yeah, so that's pretty good. Uh, interesting session today. So invasive animals and feral pigs... Now, I didn't really touch on it, but invasive, invasive species in Australia aren't just limited to animals. So we've got weeds as well. We've got bacteria. We've got fungus. So there's a fungus in frogs called chytrid that's already killed, that's already made four frog species in Australia extinct. So invasive spe species get brought in through various methods, whether it's on ships, in, in, um, in transport of goods, all sorts of things. And it's on us to be able to, to try and stay on top of that. It's on us to report it to your local biosecurity uh, branch of the government here if you see a bird that you know is invasive that has never been seen before it's up to us to help report in cairns we've got yellow crazy ants now the problem if you think about it with yellow crazy ants and electric ants they love water and they get transported in soil right now imagine if this was a cattle dam in the outback what happens with those ants those crazy ants or electric ants or one of them i can't remember which they burrow underground and they love water so they they'll actually get all the way around these dams on water and what happens when the cattle come in to drink is those ants will get under the cattle's noses and bite them. And they're incredibly painful. 
is the cattle will actually be deterred from drinking that water because of the ants around that dam. They will get so deterred from going to get a drink that they'll die of thirst rather than get a drink and get bitten by the ants. So those invasive ants are infecting agriculture in an incredible way as well. All right, looks like uh, we've got a few questions here. So if you do have any questions, shoot them through now. Um, what are humans able to catch from wild pigs? So worms are some of the bad ones we can catch. Um, Shannon, um, tuberculosis is another, um, and there's a few others. So pigs were, in, were, were involved with Hendra a while ago. So bats, horses, and pigs can, can be vectors for Hendra virus. Um, the relationship there is pigs would often nest or not nest, but they'd lie under the, the colonies of bats, uh, which if they've got Hendra virus, will drop it and pigs could eat it. Um, but worms are probably one of the biggest ones we've got to worry about when eating pigs. Yeah, they can get into our uh, into our bloodstreams and, and clot things up real bad. Teresa says, so were there studies done on the effects on numbers of the bird life that are affected as pigs eating their habitat and other birds moving to other places so they can nest safely? Um, Probably there might be. There might be a, uh, studies done on that. And there's certainly a study done in Cape York where they've, it's more comparative. So exclusion of pigs, comparison of what comes back to that area. Um, some of these studies would have to be very, very elaborate. Um, I don't know of any studies where they've monitored the, the bird displacement. Um, but I'd say that that's a pretty pretty safe presumption to raise that pig, the pigs are displacing birds and where they're nesting and what, what food they're eating. You can just see it in the behavior when you're out there. And if you sit on a lagoon, um, what happens? And especially if you've got two lagoons, one's fenced and one's not. Here's a perfect example now, just happen to be on the screen. You've got two brolga coming to the top screen there, nothing in the bottom screen. That's just the chance, but yeah, that's yeah, a lot of it's observation like that, Teresa. Hey, KL, very informative. I understand so much more now about the problems with these pigs. Yeah, pigs are terrible. Cats. Go back to the start of the video if you're still on. Um, in the first 10 minutes, we talk about cats and what a big problem they are. If you've got cat, feral cats at home, or sorry, not feral cats, if you've got pet cats at home, folks, keep them inside at night. Don't let them out at night. They are terrible predators. And cats, home cats in Australia, are essentially killing as many animals because of their density in urban areas as feral cats. Uh, we just don't see it, so we don't think it's bad. Hey, Al. Yeah, you're most welcome, Al. Yeah, super helpful. Uh, Al says, thanks all for that info. Very helpful. Look forward to my second hand, second bow hunt with my recurve. My targets are cats and pigs. Perfect, yeah. And so anyone that wants to know, hunting in Australia, you're only allowed to shoot feral animals. Um, for bow hunters, uh, we can only shoot feral animals. So we're talking cats, pigs, goats, all of those animals. Um, so yeah, good on you. Get out there, do some good bow hunting, folks. An incredible sport you'll become incredibly tied to the land because of it but yeah top notch um hey jay how are you mates folks if you've got any questions please send them through don't be shy uh if you don't get them through now i'll do excuse me i'll do my best to answer them uh, after this is all done sweet so i hope i hope everyone's learned something today uh love yous all Top notch, top notch listening. Well done sitting down, folks, in ISO. Good job. Hey, if anyone's still on and you want to learn how to use your camera as well, uh, jump on our Cockatoos page. We've got uh, camera lessons up. And now that uh, the laws are getting relaxed a bit, we might actually be able to do it outside. So if you are hoping to learn how to use your camera better, I highly recommend doing one of our little uh, quick courses. Uh, they're super, super cheap. And within an hour, hour and a half, we will teach you more than you could get on any YouTube video. Um, so many of our clients say that they wish they'd done it early on as well. So, yeah. Uh, Teresa, yes, so 1080 can have effects on uh, native animals with bait. Um, but what we were saying earlier is a lot of our native animals have a, a resistance to the toxin because the toxin is derived from Australian native plants. And a lot of our native animals um, have grazed on those and have a natural resistance to those plants. There's a few native animals that have a low resistance to it, but not too many. Um, I think possums might be one, but um, that's why we use a specific feed or a specific bait in different areas or specific feeding mechanisms that only certain animals can get into. So a good uh, feral animal controller has different ways of excluding native species that might be susceptible to the 1080 toxin um, through, through the ways he uses the bait, yeah. 
what are other what other lures have been used for attracting pigs so shannon good question one of the best that i've ever used is just fermented grain so go to your local um your local feed store um we used to get cracked corn from a bloke in atherton from his feed store um soak it get a get a cattle trough buy a specific cattle trough you don't want to use one of your normal ones like one of those round ones we used to just buy them fill them up with water put a metal uh, like a bit of cementing grate or something over the top to stop birds picking at them halve the bags of the grain into other spare bags because they swell as they absorb water leave them in there for a week and they ferment and get really rancid it sucks delivering it out in the fields but that is by far the best food i've ever used to attract feral pigs is fermented cracked corn fermented grain anything you can get off a local feedlot that's cheap or that's gone off um is great but yeah the bloke that we used to get in atherton i think rock stock feed it was um we would get corn off him because he had huge corn supplies locally pretty cheap and we just ferment it for about a week and that was a great way um the other things we would use uh, i can't remember the name of it but there was a sugary molasses uh, mix that we used to use or molasses you know other olfactory things so sweet things we we'll often bring them in but usually just the fermented corn alone was enough. Hey, Jay, yeah, rock on, bro. What are the effects of the offences on other wildlife, Brian? Great question, Jay. Yeah, so a lot of the problems we had with um, some of the fences we we're putting up in Cape York, Jay's a freshwater turtle specialist, was it was having problems either trapping freshwater turtles in the wetlands or them getting stuck in some of the fences. So what we were trying to figure out is a way that some of these native animals could move through these fences without getting stuck or restricted. So freshwater turtles, um, they could essentially drown if they didn't have any way of getting out once it flooded within those areas. So there are kind of complications with some of these fences that keep native wildlife in there. Um, some wallabies would get stuck in and so we learned that we needed to provide ramps on the inside that wallabies could jump over. We would also not use barbed wire on the top strand because the wallabies could jump out and not get stuck or strung up. And same with other birds. So unfortunately, some of these fences do have negative impacts on some of the native wildlife like wallabies and freshwater turtles. Um, and we've, we've tried to uh, figure out different ways to, to prevent this from happening. But as far as I know, I, uh, I was finishing up my role there at the time that we were looking into those. And as far as I know, I think some of those guys ended up in implementing some of those techniques, I hope. Um, but yeah, not sure. Female pig urine for boars. Yeah, mate, Shannon, if you want to go and harvest some female pig urine, uh, by all means, have a crack. Go go nuts, mate. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. I love it. All right, folks, any other questions? Let's finish on a cool pig. This is a cool pig. There we go. The old fig having a box on with the pig. The old fig, the old um, possum having a box on with the pig. All right, folks, thanks for logging in today. Love your work. Uh, stay safe out there. Take care of your loved ones, and I will talk to you soon. Send us any questions in the comments later on if you have any more, or just give us a direct message, eh? Cheers, guys. Big love. Peace.